Good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. You can find us online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and on our YouTube channel. I am Dr. Renee Binder, your moderator for today's program. I am a professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco Medical School, founder and director of the Psychiatry and the Law Program, and the current president-elect of the American Psychiatric Association. Our guest is Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman, chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons and the director of New York State Psychiatric Institute. He's also author of a new book, Shrinks, the Untold Story of Psychiatry, which unfolds the story of psychiatry's origins and the serious growing pains it has endured on its way to becoming an accepted, evidence-based profession. Dr. Lieberman is a physician and scientist who has spent his career caring for patients and researching the nature and treatment of mental illness. He's a former president of the American Psychiatric Association, the author or editor of hundreds of articles in the scientific literature, and a dozen books. Welcome, Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman, to San Francisco. Thanks very much, Renee. Thank you very much, Renee. Am I being heard okay in the back? Audio okay? Okay. Well, in conclusion, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, but it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, San Francisco is one of my favorite cities. Uh, I love being in uh, uh, sort of uh, illustrious sort of old buildings and uh, uh, organizations like the Commonwealth Club. And to be introduced by my good friend and colleague, uh, Renee, is um, you know, really an added treat. Uh, I want to thank the Commonwealth Club for organizing this and for hosting the event and all of you for, for coming. Um, I'm kind of an unlikely person to be you know, sort of standing here doing this, meaning kind of a book uh, talk, um, because as Renee mentioned, my career has been uh, spent 30 plus years largely doing research on the psychopharmacology and neurobiology of uh, mental disorders and taking care of patients. but. I guess somewhere along the way and more recently and uh, in part as a result of my stint as APA president, which uh, Renee's about to uh, assume uh, now, I got radicalized and um, it just uh, crystallized in my mind that the situation we're in, which is that um, millions of people in this country and around the world um, suffer from mental illnesses for which there are good and safe treatments, but they don't get those treatments, either because they're not aware of what they're suffering from and what's out there, or because of shame or embarrassment, or because they don't, they don't know how to get access to competent care. And that is in the Yiddish of my old grandmother, a shander. It's shameful um, that we could do this. And you know, it's, it's kind of the equivalent that what if we had a population of people in the United States that had infectious diseases, malaria, tuberculosis, uh, pneumonia, um, HIV, and we weren't using, they weren't getting antibiotics, they weren't getting vaccines, they weren't getting protease inhibitors. I mean, nobody would stand for that. I mean, maybe Jenny McCarthy would, but uh, uh, not a lot of other people. And we sort of accept this uh, in psychiatry. And it's because mental illness and psychiatry has had a kind of checkered reputation and continues to be stigmatized. And it's gone on for hundreds of years. Um, and the thing is, is that where in the past that was understandable and maybe even to some degree justified to be suspicious and uh, wary. Um, it isn't now, but the old attitudes you know, prevail. Uh, and that's 
just something we, we should not stand for anymore. And I, I have numerous, numerous examples. You know, I could go on for hours about patients or situations which illustrate this. Um, uh, I start out in the book, the introduction of the book has the story of a young girl, the daughter of a very sort of famous person um, who is going to an Ivy League school and has problems and has to be pulled out. And for two years, the family sends her to see every manner of kind of um, a, uh, a self-esteem therapist, a motivational coach, a uh, holistic uh, center's wilderness camp before their primary care doctor finally said, you know, for Christ's sake, you know, take her to see a, a real doctor. So she comes and uh, I do an evaluation, um, and uh, afterwards I said to the family, I said, I hate to tell you this, but your daughter has psychotic disorder, and I, my, the likelihood is it's probably schizophrenia. 22-year-old girl at an Ivy League school, the light of their life, and they heard me but did everything imaginable to sort of avoid acknowledging or accepting that she had a mental illness. Um, I won't go on with the rest of the story, it's in, in the book, but um, that's an example of somebody who obviously had wealth, had access, had knowledge, uh, would do that to their, actually the thing that brought her to a crisis was that the young girl who was out of school living at home was supposed to meet her mother for uh, lunch. And she's on the subway, and instead of going to where she was supposed to, she uh, succumbs to the entreaties of some sleazy guy who tells her to get off with him and takes her back to his apartment. The mother gets frantic and trying to reach her, finally tracks her through her cell phone and calls the police and they pick her up and you know, who knows what, what might have happened. So they really got freaked by this. Um, but this is what happens all the time. And uh, there's innumerable examples. I don't, this is a little bit speculative, but right now in the news you've got this situation with Robert Durst. You've heard about that? So uh, again, this is speculation, but if you read, and I've you know, tried to read what's available, um, this is a weird guy who's been weird for a long time, including, including when he was a child. And um, as far as I can tell, he never got treated diagnosed, obviously he, in addition to being weird, very likely killed some people in a very weird way. Um, and uh, then he confessed in a documentary. You know, he goes in the bathroom and starts talking. Well, a lot of people mumble to themselves, but people who have auditory hallucinations also talk to their voices. So the, the scenario I'm painting is it's possible for this sort of scion of a very wealthy family to have been sick for all these years and never gotten evaluated or treated. Now, um, if you had some kind of respiratory problem, cardiac problem, Jackson intestinal problem, what's the likelihood of that happening? It's very low. Also, in the book, I have a, a story about um, true story. All, this, all the stories in the book are accurate, meaning they're real cases described as they happened, just the details have been anonymized. But this was a um, was called to do a consult on a 65-year-old woman, Asian woman, and um, she was from a, a wife of a very wealthy financier. Um, very, had a terrible skin infection, and I'm thinking, why are they calling a psych consult? Particularly me, the chairman of the department. Well, she was a VIP. So I go see her, and immediately I'm struck by the fact that this woman is uh, out of her mind. You know, she was screaming, she was incoherent, she was uncooperative. I read the history, and I called and scheduled an appointment with the family, the husband, the children, adult children come in, and they tell me the story that I almost fell off my chair. So this is a prominent Asian American family, wealthy financial services business, and the mother the patient had been a graduate of medical school, 26, developed mental illness, diagnosed with schizophrenia. She was never treated. She was kept in the house, well taken care of, 
but never introduced sort of socially, never taken out, never sort of being taken for treatment in that time until she had to come to the hospital for this infection. And I said, well, you know, there's treatments that work and explained the whole thing. They couldn't make a decision about whether they would allow her to be transferred to the psychiatric unit after that. And they said they want to think about it and came back two days later and told me they decided against treatment and they were going to take her home after she was medically cleared because the difficulty, the, com the complications of sort of explaining to the community and their family and sort of their certain network, social network, was too problematic. These are true stories. So all of these things basically reflect what I was saying before, which is this persistent stigma. Now, the reality is that a lot of this was understandable because for most of human history, and certainly in the history of modern medicine and um, you know, the evolution of psychiatry as a discipline, which began at the beginning of the 19th century, um, there was very limited, substantive, accurate scientific knowledge about mental illness and treatments that worked. They didn't work, or in some cases, they were actually even harmful. Um, and uh, as a result, psychiatry came to develop a uh, somewhat unsavory reputation. Um, but things changed, and the kind of inflection point occurred post-World War II, uh, and has since then, the field has been driven by a series of scientific advances, beginning with psychopharmacology, but then the introduction of modern neuroimaging methods with magnetic resonance imaging, PET scanning, um, molecular genetics, which is transforming all of medicine with what, what is now called personalized or precision medicine, of the burgeoning growth of a discipline of neuroscience, which is, focuses all of the basic science disciplines on understanding the brain. And this tidal wave, this rising tide, has carried psychiatry along with it. And by virtue of that, and by virtue of the serendipitous discovery of a number of different pharmacologic agents, um, it's no longer the case that if you have a mental illness, you're doomed to basically endure your symptoms and not be able to have any prospect of kind of effective treatment. But the attitudes about you know, psychiatry's past the murky, mysterious notions about mental, what mental illness is um, have persisted, and in a very virulent way. Um, I was just on a radio program before, and it was a live program. Um, the host's name was Michael, Michael, Krasny. Michael Krasny. Great interview. Turns out we went to the same high school together. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, um, you got you know some angry calls, you know, and I've gotten some you know some twe tweets lately, I'm, courtesy of the publisher, gotten into social media, and so I've gotten some sort of angry tweets. So what kind of discipline of medicine elicits this kind of reaction? I mean, you know, cardiology doesn't, uh, dermatology doesn't. Um, there's no other movement in medicine where you have an anti movement, but there's a virulent anti psychiatry movement, and. You know, there there seems to be. It's not just it's not just a intellectual debate about knowledge or interpretation of data. It seems to be an ideological, you know, vendetta. Now, Scientology has clearly been in the front of it, but it's not just Scientology. Uh, and it's it's I think uh, uh, curious and very disturbing that this sort of virulent. Uh, prejudice persists, and the reality is, is it doesn't just hold psychiatry to the appropriate kind of standard. What it does is that um, it deters people from seeking treatment because they, if they don't know, they don't know what to believe. You know, do I have a problem? Don't I have a problem? If I do, who do I see? Is it a psychiatrist? Is it a psychologist, a social worker? Is it my, uh, is it a pastoral counselor? Is it my clergyman? Or is it some new age person? And so, anyway, this was largely the motivation for 
writing the book, and uh, I was to s try and sort of put something out there that might help to set the record straight and cut through the um, fog of misinformation and enable people to get a clear picture. But to do that, I felt it was important to tell the story you know, in a candid and unvarnished way, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, about some of the mi mistakes that were made in the past. Um, and so that's what it's intended to so I, I, you know, When I developed a proposal and went to the publisher, uh, I had a um, proposal for a book along these lines, and I had a nice, what I thought, appropriately poetic kind of name. Um, the publisher says, so what's the title, do you think? And I said, well, I was thinking of Pariahs in the Palace of Medicine, or <laughs> Sojourn in the Scientific Wilderness or something. And the editor looks at me and goes, uh-uh. That's not going to work. And um, I said, well, what do you think should do? He said, well, look, give, me a, give me a couple of days. So they did their internal focus group or whatever they do and um, came back to me and said, here's, your book, here's the title, Shrinks, the Untold Story of Psychiatry. So I said, Shrinks, isn't that a little demeaning? And she said, demeaning, shmeaning. You want to sell books or what? <laughs> And you know, you're not writing this book for your colleagues, you're writing this book for the general sort of audience. So, you know, Renee and I are in academic psychiatry and we write, you know, it's the publisher parish thing, so we write a lot of stuff, but it's for you know scientific or professional audiences. Um, but writing for the general audience is a lot harder than I thought. And it has to be accessible, it has to be interesting. Uh, and everything, so that was a real effort to try and um, you know get this in, into the book um, and uh, to make it something that people would you know be interested and, and engage and enjoy reading, but at the same time help to inform them and dispel a lot of the misinformation and misperceptions that exist. Now, um, among the things that have I think been done wrong or missteps in the past that have been rectified. I'd just like to mention two. Um, apart from there having been kind of uh, limited or insubstantial scientific bases for defining and understanding mental disorders, there was also the um, uh, inclusion or, or representation of what might be kind of subjective opinion and also social biases or prejudices into diagnostic nosology. And unfortunately, psychiatry and mental illness has been sort of an instrument that's been used from time to time for the wrong reasons. And I can remember during the Soviet era, there was a diagnosis in Russia called sluggish schizophrenia that was basically a diagnosis that was uh, to, to have that illness, you had to be a dissident, have you know anti-communist or Soviet government views. So it was obviously a political instrument of, of repression. Well, within the psychiatric nomenclature for a number of years, uh, there was a diagnosis of homosexuality as a social. I mean, as a sexual deviation and mental disorder, and uh, obviously that was wrong. There was no scientific basis to it. Um, it reflected basically social moral attitudes and, or prejudices. Um, but during a pivotal time in the history of the field and particularly uh, under the auspices of the American Psychiatric Association, um, that was addressed and was rectified. Um, so the point there is, is that the field, even though it's sort of uh, fumbled along and you know, kind of blindly moved forward or attempted to move forward, um, it's also attempted to correct its, its, its errors and to proceed in a, a way that is scientifically sound and consistent with the mission of physicians and, and, and psychiatrists. Um, a second area that I would point to that was a similar uh, egregious uh, omission, not just by psychiatry, but our society, um, was PTSD. So PTSD in many ways is, 
I think of as the kind of um, signature or prototypic mental illness because it's a condition that occurs in individuals who are ostensibly healthy and they undergo a uh, traumatic experience or series of experiences and that induces changes in their mental state and their behavior that are enduring. So it shows you the uniqueness of psychiatry and the brain because every other illness of the body, to have a problem with your heart, your lungs, your liver, your stomach, your kidneys, you need to have a tangible insult, whether it's infection, a toxin, a vascular anomaly, trauma, a metabolic disturbance. Um, the brain is the only one that you can have a uh, existential insult that can induce illness. So PTSD can't be a new illness because, I mean, you know, the brain's the brain and stress is stress. And uh, it must have existed through human history, particularly in the context of warfare, which is one of the worst stressors. Um, but the military was uninterested in recognizing that. I mean, again, it's sort of more understandable because um, it's antithetical to war. You know, war, you know, the your soldiers are encouraged to be invulnerable and um, to think that you need to deal with your kind of emotional reactions to it is not consistent with that mentality. Um, so in World War I, when shell shock was occurring, you know, its victims were tried as cowards and sometimes executed. In World War II, it could no longer be avoided because there was 20% of all casualties were psychological casualties. And the military had to countenance this in psychiatry as a uh, discipline of medicine. It wasn't just like battlefield traumatic surgery, trauma medicine. It was also psychiatric medicine. Um, but after World War II, everybody forgot. You know, there was no diagnosis that made it into the DSM nomenclature. Um, there was no research or effort to understand what caused PTSD, what goes on in the brain that produces this, and what treatments will work. And it wasn't until Vietnam. And Vietnam was really the, the uh, turning point in terms of recognizing that. And it was in the aftermath of that that PTSD ultimately was defined as a diagnostic condition, found its way into the diagnostic nomenclature. Um, again, at the same time that homosexuality was also sort of removed. So there is this, this restorative, this corrective process that the profession has tried to uh, pursue in the context of understanding. So the last thing I want to say before sort of stopping and uh, uh, engaging in some discussion with, with Renee is um, that um, uh, the reason why the progress, you know, I, the way I, I refer to psychiatry sometimes is the Rodney Dangerfield of medicine, you know, doesn't get the proper respect. Um, it's been kind of a stepchild or a late bloomer. Um, and the reason why it has been, and, and, and because, the, you know, came up with a lot of fanciful theories and maybe ineffective or barbaric treatments in a desperate effort. Um, wasn't because, you know, the doctors were slackers or, or venal. Um, it turned out that it was because the brain and these illnesses were extremely complex and difficult to figure out. You know, when you think about it, the heart is basically a pump. It's a muscle with chambers. You know, the, the kidney is a filter. Um, the stomach is a tube, you know, with porous uh, absorption. Um, the brain is like unfathomably complex, over 100 billion neurons, over 30 trillion connections. It does everything from the most basic functions of temperature regulation and movement to creativity and abstract reasoning and thought. And the brain, the areas of the brain that we're concerned with are the areas that are the most highly evolved in evolution. You know, the areas of the brain that developed most recently in Homo sapiens. And the functions that we study are the functions that are the most complicated and the most sophisticated in the whole animal kingdom. So, it, it, and we didn't have the instrumentation. You know, uh, Galileo and couldn't prove heliocentrism until he had a telescope and Pasteur couldn't discover microorganisms until he had a, a microscope. Well, the instrumentation just wasn't there. Um, so this had to wait until 
there was adequate technology and um, sort of progress or knowledge to be able to get traction. And that's where we're at now. So going forward, I foresee a period of really tremendous progress, which will build upon what's already occurred in the last 50 years, and will you know, continue to kind of uh, elevate psychiatry to a same sort of level as other disciplines in medicine, and really take mental illness out of the category of kind of a mysterious, poorly understood, highly stigmatized uh, group of disorders. And you know, for the roughly one quarter of the population that will in their lifetime suffer from a mental illness, that's very good news. So with that, I will stop and uh, engage in some discussion before taking questions. Commonwealth Club of California program, and we're talking to Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman, author of Shrinks, The Untold Story of Psychiatry. I am Dr. Renee Binder, your moderator, and you can hear Commonwealth Club programs on the radio, catch up with us on Facebook and Twitter, and see program videos on our YouTube channel. Dr. Lieberman, what do you see as the three to five most exciting advancements in psychiatry, and let's say in the last five to ten years? Well, uh, the uh, advances, I think, sort of occur on, 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 on let's say, th three areas. And these are, these are kind of uh, alluded to in, in chapter, the last chapter of the book. On the scientific side, on the service implementation side, and then on the kind of uh, social, political side. So on the scientific side, um, I think that <clears throat> with largely the use of neuroscience, both clinical neuroscience with imaging, uh, molecular neurobiology with using transgenic uh, animal models, um, and with human molecular genetics, um, we're going to see basically a definition of mental illnesses that are more precise and valid. So it's you know, we currently have something like depression, but depression is a broad category defined by a set of symptoms within that category, which everybody is lumped into and then treated you know, with uh, common treatments. There's probably multiple different subtypes. And with this research capability, we're now getting to the point where these can be dissected. And as part of this also, um, particularly as the genetics is unraveled, um, the genetics, as is already being done with cancer, the genetics will lead to treatments, treatments that never would have been considered as being applied to those particular disorders previously. On the services side, you know, it's interesting, uh, a lot of, most people think that in order to have, you know, progress, improve public health, and improve longevity and quality of life, you need to have some kind of scientific advance or breakthrough. And that's true to a large degree, but a lot of it also, public health is improved just on practical implementation of knowledge. So for example, um, good hygiene, um, sanitation, uh, sterile technique in surgery, hand washing, um, CPR. You know, these have been very important. So what we're seeing now in the context of mental health services is the implementation of knowledge been acquired from research, and one of the best examples of this is what's called the early psychosis, early intervention, uh, early detection intervention uh, model of service delivery for psychosis. And what this is is that it's a model of services to establish you know, specialized clinics which have a team of psychiatrists, um, a therapist, a uh, kind of an um, educational or vocational coach, substance abuse uh, a counselor um, to identify people when they first become ill and provide them with a comprehensive treatment program to kind of nip the illness in the bud. And then the third thing is, is that I think we're finally getting some attention at the legislative level to uh, making mental illness sort of equally supported. Uh, the Mental Health Parity Act was a big part of that. Um, and uh, um, in order to be able to provide reimbursement for care that's equivalent to medical surgical services. And uh, I think now there's more advocacy to 
putting pressure on government to address what have been historical health care disparities. And I think the public in general is becoming more accepting of mental illness. You know, it's, it's, it's still stigmatized, but less so than it has been, and it's improving, albeit slowly. So we have a question about psychodynamic psychotherapy and about psychoanalysis, and how do you see that in the armamentarium of treatments for mental um, illness? Well, psychoanalytic theory and psychodynamic therapy sort of uh, uh, derives from Sigmund Freud, who was the most famous and uh, most important psychiatrist in history. And Freud was a towering figure. In the book, I refer to him as the most heroic and important figure in the history of psychiatry, but at the same time, it's most calamitous rogue. And um, the theory that he came up with at the end of the 19th century was a brilliant, a brilliant tour de force of a, uh, of a, of a genius, because it provided the first time in history a way of understanding the human mind, you know, parts of the mind, the id, ego, superego, um, a conscious and an unconscious. Before that, and there was no concept of an unconscious. Uh, ways in which an individual managed stresses, threats, um, emotional difficulties through defense mechanisms. So he came up with a brilliant theory. Um, the problem was is that the theory was never subjected to scientific verification through through research, and also it was expanded beyond the scope of its relevance. It was, it was a great theory for human psychological development and for understanding the uh, problems of what I'll sort of um, casually refer to as the worried well. Uh, but it didn't explain schizophrenia. It didn't explain bipolar disorder. It didn't explain depression. It didn't explain obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, uh, or addictions, or autism. Um, and it was extended to apply to this, and, and that just wasn't right. So what it now is, is an important discipline among other sources of information to inform the uh, trainees or students who are learning psychiatry and practitioners of psychiatry, and it remains an important way of understanding you know, how human minds develop, uh, how human behavior results, um, and to be applied in the instances where it's appropriate. So, you know, if you have problems with your boss or you have a difficulty in terms of your romantic uh, relationships or you're you know, repeatedly engaging in self-defeating behaviors or things of this sort, psychodynamic therapy can be very helpful in helping you to sort of understand and to help to alleviate. But it's not something which is going to uh, alleviate necessarily psychosis or uh, 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 mania or, or melancholic depression. So I was interim chair of the Department of Psychiatry at UCSF. We actually have one of our associate residency training um, directors in the audience, and we have observed the phenomenon. It, it's, um, UCSF is a very competitive residency to get into, as is um, Columbia. And we get some of the best medical students um, in the country. And on graduation, I would say at least 25% or so of our residents um, decide to have careers where they're practicing using psychodynamic um, psychotherapy. Many of them are going to the Psychoanalytic Institute um, in San Francisco. And this is at the time that they're getting um, a lot of training in community psychiatry. They're also getting training in neuroscience and in the genetics of mental illness, but what they're choosing um, to go into, at least a certain percentage of them, is to learn about psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapy, despite all of the other training that they're getting. So what are your thoughts about that? Well, we see the same phenomenon, um, and I think that reflects a couple of things. One is, is that um, psychoanalytic theory and psychodynamic uh, um, therapy retains a... Um, uh, an important uh, place in the curricula that residents are trained by. Um, and also, um, it is very, very appealing. You know, there's a, a syndrome in, in medical students that whenever you sort of read about an illness, you think you have it. And, and, and so when you come into psychiatry and you begin reading Freud, 
uh, it's like, wow, I've just discovered the answer to all my problems. You know, uh, uh, I can understand myself. I can figure out. And it's, there's, there's just this huge kind of intellectual appeal to it. Um, and then your supervisors become your, you know, who are analysts, you know, sort of help to cultivate a, a, uh, a kind of identification with this, this role. So um, a lot of that, I think, is vestigial. In other words, um, uh, it persists because it's, you know, this is a sort of generational or multi-generational thing before the field you know, fully sort of um, transforms itself. Uh, but I think, you know, and this, I, 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 don't, I don't have a crystal ball, but what I would say, what's going to happen is, is that um, economics is going to be the big driver. You know, what, uh, what are people willing to pay or what are insurance companies or the government willing to pay? And uh, are they going to pay a psychiatrist to sit with uh, a patient for 45 minutes, once, twice uh, a week, um, and in, engage in this at the level that, you know, I mean, when you come out of a psychiatric uh, residency, you're, you're, you're in your early 30s, um, and you've been a student or working at, like, you know, uh, slave wages uh, for your life, and you're probably just getting a family or and, and wanting to start sort of your life, and, and you, know, you need to, to earn a living. Um, so who's the best, you know, so what's the government willing to pay for? And what are insurers willing to pay for? So you'll have in San Francisco and in New York, you have an affluent population that'll pay out of pocket, so there'll always be this kind of niche market. Um, but in terms of what's going on in the rest of the country, uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see. So we have some questions about the DSM, so let me um, ask you, um, what do you see as the importance of the D Diagnostic and Statistical Manual? There certainly was some controversy about it, and you talk in your book about moving from DSM-1 to 2 to 3, to 3R, 4, and now to 5, and I wonder if you could talk a bit about the history of the DSM and also the current relevance. Right. Well, um, all, all medicine relies on diagnoses. And um, the, the uh, diagnoses for all medical illnesses is encompassed in something called the Inter International Classification of Diseases maintained by the World Health Organization. And uh, they're currently going on their 11th iteration. Gets modified every you know, decade or two. Um, and includes mental illnesses. And what this code has is it has an illness, you know, pneumonia, congestive heart failure, uh, seizure disorder, um, schizophrenia, uh, and a number. And that's it. Um, what the DSM was conceived to do was basically provide a more detailed description of each disorder, in addition to the name, in addition to the code. Um, now, the question then becomes with regard to mental illness, what is the sort of validity and the reliability, consistency in terms of these disorders. The validity refers to, do you know that it's a real disorder caused by something? The reliability means that, will all the doctors diagnose it the same way? And um, those have been the kind of the challenges for psychiatry and the APA, which develops the DSM largely. And the criticisms have been that you know, the diagnoses are a matter of opinion as opposed to a matter of fact or, or data or information and that um, they keep expanding and pathologizing normal behavior. You know, we're making these up. Uh, we're making them up to drum up business for ourselves or to you know, have excuses to prescribe medications so we can, you know, the drug companies can make profits and, and everything. And that's where much of the controversy sort of centers. Without getting into the details of that, let me just come at it a different way. Does mental illness exist? I mean, is, so Thomas Zaz, a psychiatrist in the 1960s, wrote a book, you know, The Myth of Mental Illness. And there's many anti-psychiatry people who say that it's all, you know, bogus. Um, but if you ask the question, is there mental illness? I think most people would say, yes, there is, there is something called mental illness. So at least at the core, 
or in the middle there's some agreement. Um, you might argue about the boundaries, but there is an entity. So then the question is, how do you define it? So in all of medicine, illnesses are defined in the same way. The first way in which it's done is that a physician or researchers or individuals recognize uh, when a person develops an illness by the signs and the symptoms. So the flu, you know, get fever, get chills, body aches, maybe some respiratory symptoms. Um, it lasts for a couple weeks. Okay, so that's the flu. And um, congestive heart failure. Um, it used to be that congestive heart failure was called dropsy because people had edema and it dropped to the bottom of their legs and you know, dropsy was a pretty concrete way of describing it. Um, diabetes was based on somebody peeing a lot or drinking a lot and then the doctor tasting the urine. If it tasted sweet, it was diabetes mellitus. If it was watery, it was diabetes insipidus. Um, but then the next level is understanding what in the body the pathologic basis is. Um, and that's where blood tests, x-rays, EKGs come in. And then the final level is what's the cause of the illness? You know, is it a virus? Is it a enzyme? Is it a um, vascular occlusion? Uh, what? Um, so at psychiatry, we're still at that first level. We're going to progress to the next level, but we're still at the first level. So you know, there are sort of issues about uh, how we define certain things. So for example, in the DSM-5, the decision was made to call, uh, to do away with the, the diagnosis of Asperger's and include it into autism spectrum disorders. Um, so that was a definitional issue. And based on evidence, genetic, symptomatic, but it was a definitional issue to sort of combine those. Um, so the DSM has undergone this uh, process of evolving in order to achieve better levels of validity and reliability, but uh, it can't be any better than the scientific knowledge that's extant about the illnesses. It can't, it can't say, okay, here's a blood test that we're going to require. You're going to have to get a blood test to prove that you have schizophrenia, or you're going to have to have an EKG for the brain to show that you have uh, depression. Um, someday we will have such tests, but right now we don't. So the DSM can only reflect the science, and I think we're getting beaten up on a lot because there's not been more progress and we haven't moved beyond that first level. Let me follow up on that. So what do you see in the future? The psychiatrist of the future, a patient comes in, they have some behavioral problem, some depression, and what will happen in the psychiatrist's office? I think they'll go through, a, a um, as they do currently, a comprehensive sort of uh, a history and mental status evaluation. Um, I don't know that psychiatrists will sort of resume doing physical exams like used to be done or like residents still do, um, maybe. Uh, but then, um, based on whatever you know, diagnostic assessments are also relevant, not just for ruling out, but for ruling in, um, they will have those. So right now, a psychiatrist who suspects dementia or some kind of uh, attentional disorder might get neuropsychological testing. So we'll get that, but we also might get the blood tests, the MRI, um, the um, EEG or evoke potential for that. And then once a diagnosis is reached, then a treatment plan is developed. And the treatment plan may be implemented by the doctor, or maybe the doctor won't. Maybe the doctor will, will you know, very possibly be part of a team, which includes you know, other mental health providers, whether they're you know, cognitive therapists or psychologists or um, uh, uh, social vocational skills trainers, uh, substance abuse counselors, um, that they may, you know, they'll then sort of delegate to these individuals just like, you know, an orthopedist may set your broken bone or operate on your knee, but then he refers you to the uh, physical therapist. Good. Okay. So I have a question about the American Psychiatric Association. In the introductions, it was said, I'm the um, president-elect, so I'm about to take office in May, and you have completed your term as the immediate past president. 
So how did that impact you, and what did you learn as president of the American Psychiatric Association? It was a lot of work, because <laughs> um, you're doing that while you have your day job, um, uh, and didn't make my wife too happy, because I was spending a lot of weekends away. Um, but uh, it was, I'm glad I did it. It was very worthwhile, uh, and I think we were able to accomplish uh, some things um, uh, in a variety of ways. Um, you know, one very tangible way is, you know, apropos my comment about the DSM uh, kind of missteps and the inclusion of homosexuality as a disorder, um, it's probably not widely known, but we, we hired a new CEO who's the permanent staff person that runs the central office in Washington, and the new CEO is uh, um, a publicly acknowledged psychiatrist who's, who's gay, um, which I think wouldn't have happened certainly in the past, or at least in a way that was publicly known. Um, but beyond that, I think that um, I learned a lot about the uh, political process and the role that policy plays in affecting how health care is provided and how the lives of you know, the population are helped or not. And... Um, no secret to people who read the papers that uh, Washington's kind of a mess. Um, the government is uh, uh, gridlocked, and to get things sort of uh, um, legislatively, you know, uh, to progress them is very difficult. Um, and um, the only way that all of the research, all of the knowledge, all of the refinements and improvements in, in treatment and services um, is going to be you know, realized by the population is if, if, it's, if, it, if it's supported by policy. And so I realize that um, there's a huge task in terms of, you know, the old expression, a war is too, ex too important to be left to the generals. Well, health care is too important to be left to the politicians. So uh, by one means or another, whether it's getting more physicians to pursue careers in policy and in government or otherwise, we need to be uh, much more effective in that. And the other thing is, is I think uh, public opinion is such an important uh, part of this. We need to determine ways to um, engage the media and get the media to play a more constructive role rather than just you know, sensationalizing everything. So we have a question about technology and how technology is revolutionizing physical health care. So what do you see as the role of technology in mental health care? I think it's going to take several forms. Um, one uh, that will probably occur rapidly, um, particularly here in the shadow of Silicon Valley, is the use of a lot of sort of um, biosensor technology for sort of monitoring and, 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 and virtual technology um, you know, that can be uh, run off smartphones or smart watches. That'll be used. So um, devices that monitor biosignals, whether it's heart rate, respiration, temperature, uh, galvanic uh, skin response, um, uh, biochemistry, um, will become sort of routine. And also devices which are able to either assess or query people about their mental and emotional states will be uh, obtainable, transmittable to healthcare providers in real time. Um, so usually, you know, when you're in treatment for, with psychiatrists, you know, you're seeing the patient at some frequency, whether it's once a week, twice a week, once a month, or so forth. And in between, apart from the phone call or the email that you might get, you know, you don't know, really know what's going on. But there will be a way of sort of monitoring this uh, on a real-time basis. Um, and I think that's going to be very powerful. It'll also be a way for uh, psychiatrists and mental health providers to not be so kind of office or clinic or, or hospital bound. Um, there'll be virtual ways to interact. So, um, you know, I, people that I've seen have developed these scripts for uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or for managing uh, psychotic symptoms like hallucinations. Um, and uh, these scripts are on their... Uh, on their smartphones, they can be pulled up. You know, they're instructed to pull them up if they have difficulties. Instead of just taking a pill, they can pull this up also. Um, 
And then I think it'll probably go a level deeper um, in terms of implantable devices that will be available. And in that context, it's not just for information recording, it'll also be for therapy. So, you know, there's already some neuromodulatory devices that have gone beyond electroshock therapy, um, including deep brain stimulation, uh, but um, direct transcranial current stimulation. Um, I think there will be sort of um, more of these devices which may be implantable or may be um, uh, injectable that could be used for CNS-based disorders. Um, So, you know, things like the Internet have transformed the world so dramatically and uh, they're beginning to impact, you know, the whole IT, computer technology, nanotechnology area. And the other thing that relates to this is you know, President Obama just came out with this um, human brain initiative, um, and the whole thrust of it isn't to do research in a particular disorder. It's, 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 it's for inventing neurotechnology, new ways of really uh, being able to... I mean, we're talking about uh, devices that are really kind of uh, science fiction, space age type ways of being able to m- measure the behavior of thousands of neurons simultaneously. Um, so technology will play a part, but I don't know that we can sort of say exactly what directions it'll lead or in what time frame. Lots of exciting things. Um, you've sort of touched on the area of genetics and how it will affect psychiatry, but I wonder if you could say more about it. Some people have felt that the issue of genetics and psychiatry, and in some ways in all of medicine, has been somewhat of a failure, except possibly in the area of cancer that originally we thought that we would be able to identify a gene and be able to find an illness. And of course, that's been true of some illnesses, like Huntington's chorea. But in psychiatry, that has not been true. But I wonder if you could talk about the future of genetics. Sure. Well, genetics is transforming all of medicine. And um, it's, uh, it's really only recently that I think researchers have come to understand sort of the complexity of um, the genome, and how it expresses itself, and how it relates to human illness. Um, so, you know, there is in this context sort of emergent new understanding and opportunity. At the same time, it also proposes, poses a kind of a moral dilemma. I, I forget who it was who said this. I, I, I think I have this right, but this person I can't remember said that genetics poses the greatest moral dilemma to science uh, since the uh, invention of the atomic bomb um, because, you know, with, with this knowledge will come uh, a lot of possibilities of terms of influencing, you know, genetically engineered you know, people as well as establishing diagnoses in people or vulnerability to diagnoses in people well before they you know, are in the age of risk of developing the illness. So these things are not kind of uh, without, you know, without compl- complexities. But having said that, um, the, the opportunity it provides is just astonishing. And, and you are, we're already seeing it in cancer. In cancer, you used to make a diagnosis based on anatomy and histology. You know, is the tumor in your ovary, your prostate, your kidney, your lung? And then you look at it under the microscope. Is it small cell? Is it out cell? What is your Gleason score? Um, now you are looking at the genetic signature to determine the particular genetic makeup of the cells. And then the treatment is selected based on that. And sometimes it involves using a treatment that you never would have picked or using a treatment that never would have passed the FDA because it only works in 5% of the people with the cancer. So it's able to, what I call, peel the onion. And this, uh, right now, as we speak, is being applied in mental illness, but still at the experimental level. And, you know, with that will come not just much more precise diagnoses, but also this um, uh, ability to, to... uh, utilize a wider range of treatments and refined treatments. Okay. So could you say more about what we can do uh, about the negative feelings about psychiatry 
um, in terms of the stigma. It leads to discrimination against people with mental illness. And also, it leads to a reluctance of people to seek psychiatric help when they actually do have some problems. You address the, the case of the several cases where this applied, and both in your presentation and in your book. What can we do about that? Well, this is a uh, complicated problem. So how do you stamp out a stigma? Um, <clears throat> and I mean, you know, prejudices abound in the world, uh, um, and we still haven't been able to eliminate those, even with education and um, uh, you know awareness. Uh, I, I think that um, I mean, I, I'll tell you in a minute, but I, I think you know. The, the thing that will really be the most powerful is when we have a diagnostic test or better yet, have the specific cause of the illness. You know, in human history, many things have been stigmatized in medical illnesses, smallpox, the plague, uh, polio, cancer, uh, AIDS. Um, and each of these things became destigmatized uh, when the underlying cause was identified, and then treatments to manage them. So, you know, AIDS is the best example. You know, it went within a 15-year period from a mysterious death sentence to uh, a disorder with a known cause to a chronic illness that could be managed with medications. Um, so that will be the ultimate, you know, dispeller of the, the stigma. Um, in the interim, um, I suggest people do two things. One is, is uh, go out and um, feel like empowered to either with yourself or with fr friends and family uh, reach out or encourage people you think may be having a problem to seek help. The only thing they can do is waste the time and money it takes to get a consultation, um, but not sit there wondering, well, should I or shouldn't I you know, go to see a doctor or do something? And then secondly, uh, depending on what your capability or position is, um, anything we can do to make the media and the government more aware of this, you know, this hypocrisy and this, this uh, disservice that's done by misrepresenting, by uh, uh, sensationalizing, by not addressing the problem. Of mental I mean, we go round and round on this violence issue um, about you know, these killings that occur. And you point to gun control. Sure, you know, we definitely would like to have gun control, but you know, the, the first problem is, is, um, is why are these people with mental illness not getting treated? Because all of these people have, are people with disorders that are not in treatment. Same thing in the jails. You know, we, we have people in the jails. You know, so you know, the police, the poor police have to respond, and if they hurt somebody or use excess brutality, you know, they're, 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 they're vilified for this. Um, you know, why should the police be the first responders for mental illness? You know, they're not trained for this. Um, so uh, you know, we're, we're, we're avoiding looking at the root cause uh, uh, of dealing with it, which again is sort of part of this. So anything you can do to you know, communicate with the uh, media and the government, because that's really where the uh, um, leverage is, would be desirable. So we've reached the point in our program where there's time for only one last question. And um, what I wanted to ask you is, in thinking back, why did you choose to go into psychiatry in the first place, and are you happy with your choice, and why? I'm I'm uh, I'm, I'm very happy with it. I, I you know I, I tell people, you know, it, it beats working for a living. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I went. In, I mean, being a good Jewish boy, I think I was always sort of uh, you know sort of uh, uh, directed to be a doctor, but not necessarily a psychiatrist. Um, what got me interested in psychiatry initially was Freud. You know, he's, he, he is, uh, he, as an undergraduate you know, student in college, you read him in your introductory psychology class, and it's just so, uh, so captivating. But then um, I got interested in sort of the brain and behavior. You know, I confess, or I out myself in the book as having, in the 60s when I was in college, experimenting with recreational drugs, and the power of a hallucinogen. So I have one thing in common with Stephen Jobs, you know, Stephen Jobs, certainly not our financial success, um, but we both attribute uh, uh, the fact that LSD you know, was um, a, a significant experience. So, but not necessarily an enlightenment, so much as if such a small quantity of 
50 micrograms of a substance could alter your mental state so profoundly, then what did that tell you about you know, the neurochemistry or neurobiology and how that affected a person's um, mental state? So it's really the two of those things that got me fascinated with the brain. And um, you know, the logical place was either neurology and psychiatry, and psychiatry is by far the more interesting. Well, our thanks to Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman, author of Shrinks, The Untold Story of Psychiatry. Um, the books are for sale, and Dr. Lieberman will be available to sign them um, in the library. And we also want to thank our audiences here and on radio, television, and the internet. I'm Dr. Renee Binder, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>